Can I start? Yeah, the floor is yours. You can start. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and good morning, everyone. My name is Andrea Puzo. I'm from Parma in Italy, and uh, I am a PhD student in uh, food chemistry uh, at the Food and Drug Department of the University of Parma. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss my work that, is, uh, that has been made in collaboration with the Food Microbiology Unit, and uh, that is about the molecular characterization of exopolysaccharides uh, from wild lactic acid bacteria strains fed with different sugar sources. So let's start saying that uh, um, many bacteria um, took that the ability to produce polysaccharides is uh, long been known and uh, widely spread among bacteria. In fact, many bacteria can uh, synthesize many different types of polysaccharides, like for example, storage polysaccharides or structural polysaccharides or even lipopolysaccharides and so on. But um, some bacteria also can uh, uh, synthesize different types called, uh, called exopolysaccharides and abbreviated as uh, EPS that can be uh, loosely attached to the cell surface or released into the environment. And for this reason, we can talk about bound EPSs or released EPSs, respectively. Uh, recently, is the, it has been observed that among bacteria, even some lactic acid bacteria strains can produce EPS during fermentation. So the first question is, why do lactic acid bacteria produce EPS? Uh, these molecules have multiple functions and are thought to play a key role in, um, some, um, in, in the protection against some extreme conditions and environmental stresses, like, for example, temperature, pH, osmotic stresses, uh, toxic compounds, uh, biotic or abiotic stresses, and so on, but also a protection against uh, bacteriophages, for example, and also they allow the biofilm formation and adhesion to solid surfaces. Uh, however, actually their physiological role is still being studied. So the, the second question is uh, why are uh, exopolysaccharides important in foods? Uh, they have, have been proved to have, uh, in fact, from a technological point of view, they have an influence on viscosity and rheology of foods uh, they are present in. And for this reason, they can be used as emulsifiers, thickeners, gelling agents, stabilizers. Um, and uh, as a consequence of this inductive modification on viscosity, they also can prolong the shelf life of the products uh, in which are present. Then also they uh, showed in some cases an improvement uh, in the organoleptic properties. And finally, as the last uh, perspective, it's also interesting the, the possibility to employ uh, lactic acid bacteria starter cultures, which can produce these exopolysaccharides in situ as an alternative, a suitable alternative to the food additives that, uh, as we know, are often uh, undesired by many consumers. From a nutritional point of view, uh, exopolysaccharides are potential prebiotic compounds, and many authors in literature showed their antioxidant properties, but also their antibacterial, antiviral, cholesterol lowering, and immunoregulatory functions. So the potential application areas are, um, are, uh, are different, and um, currently some exopolysaccharides are, um, few exopolysaccharides are already used in, the, in food applications, especially in the dairy and in the bakery industries, but there is always a growing interest in uh, finding new sources of exopolysaccharides uh, with well-defined and well-tailored uh, properties to be fully exploited in different food applications. In fact, the most important factor that influences their technological and nutritional properties is their chemical structure. So the chemical structure of exopolysaccharides is uh, very complex and uh, variable. Um, first of all, from the monosaccharide composition point of view, they can be divided in homo or heteropolysaccharides based on the repeating units. Uh, but also the molecular weight is very variable, uh, ranging from four, uh, uh, 40,000 Daltons to 6 million Daltons. And also many differences can occur, for example, in the type of glycosidic bond in terms of linkage configuration and binding site. And finally, also they can be linear or branched. And if they are, brand if, uh, they are branched, they can present uh, many different functional groups. Uh, they, can be electric, they can present electric charges and so on. So they are very complex and uh, variable. And uh, the important aspect is that uh, the bioactivities and, technolo and technological properties of these molecules are influenced by their chemical structure. So what about this work? Uh, in collaboration with the Microbiology Research Group of Food and Drug Department, 
new wild lactic acid bacteria strains have been identified and isolated from food. And from previous analysis, they seemed to be very promising for EPS production. So of course, when the new strains are considered, it is important to study the total quantities uh, of EPS and their chemical structure, as I said. In this work in particular, it was also evaluated how uh, a single sugar selected as the only carbon source for the growth of these lactic acid bacteria strains affects the EPS quantity and their chemical structure. So in particular, three lactic acid bacteria were selected, a lactobacillus paracase called 2333, an unknown strain called, 19, uh, called 1019, that is unknown because we really don't know the, the species and the strain, and the Lactobacillus delbroeci bulgaricus called 1932. So as regards the methods, the revitalization and fermentation methods, uh, they were managed by the microbiology uh, group, but uh, briefly, uh, freeze microorganisms were re-inoculated in fresh uh, MRS commercial media, and, every, and this happened every day in order to maintain a high count of health bacteria. So um, every day a scaling up in the volume was performed day by day, and after four days, finally, they were inoculated in fresh MRS growth with a unique sugar as the only carbon source. And in this sense, the selected sugars in the various experiments were fructose, maltose, lactose, sucrose, and glucose. After that, the quantification of these produced exopolysaccharides were, uh, was performed, and the official method 991.43 for the total dietary fiber content was performed. This is an enzymatic gravimetric method which consists in uh, applying three different enzymes in succession to the sample. Uh, the first one is a thermostable alpha amylase, the second is a protease, and the third is an amyloglucosidase. Uh, and after this hydrolysis, uh, ethanol is added in order to let the exopolysaccharide to precipitate. And then, uh, after some, hour, uh, some hours, uh, the, the sample is filtered in uh, appropriate crucibles. Then, after an essication performed for one day at 100 Celsius degrees, protein content and ash content is determined on residues and, subtract, and subtracted. And in particular, the protein content was calculated from Hildel method by multiplying uh, the, nit the nitrogen by a conversion factor that is uh, 6.25, and ash content was uh, performed after mineralization uh, at uh, 550 Celsius degrees for five hours. So uh, the results of this quantification are reported in this table. Uh, nine samples were analyzed and compared uh, through one-way ANOVA statistic test, and um, different letters indicate in the table indicate different uh, significant difference uh, from a statistical point of view. Uh, so from these results, we can say that, uh, uh, first of all, different strains produced uh, different quantities of exopolysaccharides, uh, even if they were fed with the same sugar, but at the same time, also the same strain fed with different sugars showed a different capacity in the EPS production. And these results are consistent with the literature in which uh, some authors stated that uh, the quantity of uh, exopolysaccharides uh, uh, produced is strain dependent, but also affected by the carbon source. So another interesting result was that uh, um, in all the residues obtained after uh, this enzymatic gravimetric method and after the filtration, Large quantities of nitrogen were detected by the Kildal uh, analysis. And when I say large quantities, I mean uh, from 6 to 10 percent, that is very much for polysaccharides. So we asked ourselves uh, why, and we made two hypotheses. The first, that maybe other nitrogen compounds could be uh, chemically bound to EPS or trapped in it, for example, uh, nucleotides or residual peptides or proteins. And the second hypothesis was that maybe uh, there was a large presence of amino sugars like glucosamine or galactosamine in the EPS chain. So because of the latter uh, reason, uh, we also investigated the monosaccharide composition of the exopolysaccharides. And first of all, we isolated and extracted um, these, uh, these exopolysaccharides with the same method described for the quantification. So with the enzymatic gra gravimetric method followed by alcohol precipitation and followed in this case by centrifugation and essiccation at 40 degrees. And then two different uh, hydrolysis protocols were applied to investigate which monosaccharides made up the, the EPS chain. So the first method consisted in an acid hydrolysis with the trifluoracetic acid, TFA, 
But the main issue is that um, with this method, the eventually present uronic acids, like for example, glucuronic acid or galacturonic acid, uh, are not detectable due to their transformation in lactones. Uh, so a further step is, uh, is necessary, and um, it consists in an alkaline step with the addition of ammonia. Uh, and with this step, we uh, can um, reopen the lactone ring and uh, allow the full derivatization of, um, of the eventually present uronic acid. Then, uh, finally, uh, phenyl beta-glucoside was added as internal standard and analytes were silenized, uh, so derivatized with BSTFA and analyzed, finally, through uh, gas chromatography coupled with mass spectrometry. The second issue is that with this method, uh, the eventually present amino sugars, so glucosamine and galactosamine, for example, cannot be effectively released by TFA hydrolysis. So a second method was developed and uh, it consisted in an acid hydrolysis with the seven normal hydrochloric acid. And uh, then um, the hydrolysate was evaporated also in this case and both internal standard and BSTFA were added. And then the sample was simply ready to be injected in uh, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. It is important to underline that both in protocol one and in protocol two also uh, a response factor was uh, determined in order to allow the quantification, of course, of each monosaccharide. In this slide, I reported the two examples, uh, two pictures uh, as examples from uh, obtained from the two different hydrolysis methods. So the first one obtained after um, TFA hydrolysis, uh, we can say that uh, we can see that uh, we clearly detected uh, the neutral sugars, like for example, glucose, galactose, or mannose. And in the second picture, we can see that uh, uh, the amino sugars were clearly uh, detected. So as regards the, um, the results of the monosaccharide composition, I, uh, 15 samples were analyzed. And uh, in this table, I reported the, the results, but uh, for simplicity, only the first three monosaccharides uh, were showed. And the first thing that we can see is that uh, 13 samples out of 15 have glucose and mannose as the two most abundant monosaccharides. Um, in particular, the exopolysaccharides produced by strain 2333 were made up for 60 to 90 percent by glucomannans. Uh, those produced by strain 1019 were made up for 42 to 80 percent by glucomannans and, and also showed high quantities of ramnos, and those produced by strain 1932 were made up for uh, 47 to 64 percent by glucomannan. Anyway, also uh, ribose, galactose, glucosamine, galactosamine, and fructose were always present in all these samples, um, and in particular, glucosamine and galactosamine uh, caught our atten attention because, as I said previously, a high quantity of these, um, of these amino sugars in the, in the EPS chain could explain the high quantities uh, of, uh, of nitrogen that we uh, previously found with um, Hildal analysis. But actually, their content was uh, low, ranging from 1 to 10 percent of total EPS uh, for, as regards glucosamine, and from 0.1 to 6 percent of total EPS uh, regarding uh, galactosamine. So another interesting result is that the strain 2333 did not produce uh, in, uh, in any sample uh, ramnos containing EPS. Uh, so regardless of the carbon source, uh, ramnos was never present in this uh, EPS chain. So this is an interesting result because um, it suggests that in a certain way, the monosaccharide composition of this EPS is strain dependent. But uh, at the same time, a correlation between the added sugar in the media and its quantity found in EPS chain, especially for fructose and galactose, was found. And in fact, as we can see here, um, the, the, the higher fructose uh, expressed as a percentage on, uh, on the total EPS was always found where the fructose was added as the only carbon source. So in two cases, the higher fructose was found in correspondence of uh, uh, fructose as it added as the only carbon source, and in one case, when sucrose was added. Uh, but as we know, sucrose is a uh, fructose containing the saccharide. And the same happened to galactose. So the higher galactose was always found when lactose was employed as the only carbon source. And as we know, lactose is a galactose containing the saccharide. So in general, the obtained the 
results for uh, Lactobacillus paracase A2333 were in agreement with uh, some studies in literature which showed a main presence of mannose, glucose, and galactose. And uh, the results obtained for uh, Lactobacillus del Brueck Bulgaricus 1932 were different than some studies in literature which showed the only presence of galactose and glucose. But these differences can be explained, simply explained by the fact that uh, even if in these studies the, the species was the same, the strain was not. So uh, another important feature for polysaccharides in general and uh, for exopolysaccharides in this case is the, the molecular weight. Uh, and we um, investigate the molecular weight uh, in, the, in some samples. So first of all, we isolated uh, exopolysaccharides with the same method previously described for the quantification. So always with the uh, enzymatic gravimetric method followed by ethanol precipitation and followed by centrifugation and acidification. And then these extracted exopolysaccharides were, were simply dissolved in ultra pure water and then filtered through a nylon membrane. Then they were simply ready to be analyzed through high performance, size exclusion chromatography coupled with a refracted index detector. The calibration curve was determined using standard uh, pullulans with a well defined molecular weight. So in this slide, I reported uh, four overlaid chromatograms um, of four different samples uh, obtained with the HPSEC analysis. This is an analysis which, uh, allow, uh, which allows to separate macromolecules in one sample based on their size. So the more a peak appears on the left, the more the molecule is big, and the more a peak appears on the right, the more uh, the molecule is small. And uh, in this picture, we can say that uh, the, the unknown strain uh, called the 1019 had with uh, different sugar sources, so with maltose, sucrose, fructose, and lactose, showed different profiles in the molecular weight composition. Uh, in, this, in this table, I reported the, all the fractions found, um, the, the molecular weight fractions uh, found, and we can see, first of all, that in all uh, the EPS samples, at least three different fractions uh, have been found. And uh, uh, as regards the exopolysaccharides produced from Lactobacillus paracase 2333, um, uh, these exopolysaccharides showed very similar characteristics uh, regardless of the carbon source. In fact, in all the three samples analyzed, uh, a low molecular weight fraction was always found and uh, it was about uh, 10 kilodaltons, and this fraction accounted for more than 50%, and the high molecular weight fraction was always found uh, ranging from um, 108 kilodaltons to 127 kilodaltons, but this fraction accounted for only the 6%. Uh, the profile in, uh, of uh, unknown strain 1019 was a little bit more complicated, and in particular, the exopolysaccharide the fractions showed the similar characteristics two by two. Um, a very high molecular weight fraction was found only in two cases, so when unknown strain 1019 was fed with the lactose and sucrose, and this fraction was, uh, had a molecular weight higher than 500 kilodaltons, and uh, this fraction was absent when uh, the same strain was fed with fructose and with, and, and with maltose. But despite this, a low molecular weight fraction was always found in all the four samples, um, and these fractions accounted for uh, 30 to 50 uh, percent, and also two medium uh, similar molecular weight fractions were found in all the four samples, so the first one with a molecular weight ranging from 40 to 50 kilodaltons, and the second one uh, with a molecular weight ranging from 90 to 120 kilodaltons, and both together these fractions accounting for 30 to 50 percent more or less. So to conclude my presentation, uh, my work uh, showed that uh, both lactic acid bacteria strains and the carbon source uh, they are fed with uh, can affect the exopolysaccharides production uh, in terms of quantities and uh, molecular structure, and in particular in terms of monosaccharide composition and molecular weight. Um, this is important because different lactic acid bacteria strains, if managed with different condi growing conditions, can be exploited in the food industry, tailoring the exopolysaccharide structure 
according to the uh, requested technological or functional properties. And from this work also emerged that uh, all the isolated and extracted EPS samples uh, proved to have large quantities of residual nitrogen. And for this reason, we, uh, we will perform additional analysis like, uh, for example, NMR in order to further elucidate their chemical structure. And also as a future goal in the near future, we will um, investigate uh, the different fractions having different molecular weights in order to, to, to further study them in, uh, in terms of composition and uh, properties. But uh, that's all for the moment. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, this was very interesting uh, interface between microbiology and um, polysaccharide science. I think I have a trouble with my camera, sorry. Is it working? Yes. Uh, yes, so yeah, this is... I'm sorry for this. Okay. Uh, yes. So yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that this biotechnology using microorganism is a very interesting way to and strategy to 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 go to to new polysaccharides and new materials for for sure. Um, I have some question. Ah, there are some question. Good. Um, there is a first question about the, the, the type of sugar that you use. Can it affect the cultural condition? Uh, affect the cultural conditions? Uh, on, yeah. Honestly, I, I don't know, because as I said, I, I don't manage this part of the work. It was managed by the microbiology research group. So they uh, prepared the samples and I am... Um, I made, I performed the chemical analysis, so in terms of structure, uh, so specific uh, uh, things about uh, uh, the growth, uh, the, the, the growth of these uh, lactic acid bacteria. I don't know, but um, I can ask to my colleagues if uh, if it's needed. Okay. Um... Another question is about uh, the possibility to separate the, the high molecular weight obtained with the 2019 strain. And did you also elucidate the structure of this? Yes, of course. And yes, of course. And as I said, it will be a, a future goal. Uh, the separation can be, for example, performed with the same method. So the uh, HPSAC, the high performance site exclusion chromatography, uh, or even with, uh, uh, for example, mm, other techniques, it is surely possible to separate them. And um, it will be interesting to, to investigate the composition also uh, of the different fractions in terms of the different monosaccharide composition in order to see if uh, uh, different molecular weight fractions have uh, different, totally different monosaccharide composition, for example. Uh, we surely investigate uh, further about this. Okay, so this is the plan uh, for the next few months. I, I yes, imagine. of course. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is another question about the. Um, you showed that uh, the the polymers have different composition, and um, the, the 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 person is willing to, to know better what what will be the difference for final application. I mean, you have different structure, maybe different molecular weights, different functions. Uh, of your the, uh, the only the only sure things is that the the chemical structure affect affects the final um, the, the final application but it's complicated because uh, uh, surely as regards the molecular weight uh, we can say that uh, a higher molecular weight could affect more uh, the viscosity so uh, for example um, in foods of course uh, a higher viscosity can be can be used to obtain higher uh, texturizing uh, effects. And also from, um, from a nutritional point of view, the, uh, a higher viscosity have different uh, effects. So um, the, the monosaccharide composition on, on, on its side uh, is more complicated because um, when we talk about homopolysaccharides, it's, it's easier to say that, uh, for example, a glucan uh, have different properties than uh, a galactan or a fructan. But when we talk about heteropolysaccharides, it's more complicated. So there are uh, quite infinite conditions and, and combinations. So it's not easy to, to say, but uh, in general, we say we saw that in this study, 
all the three strains uh, produced glucomannans, predominantly uh, glucomannans uh, polysaccharides, and glucomannans are um, showed to be uh, very important, for example, from a nutritional point of view in the immunomodulatory effect, but also in the antioxidant, uh, in the antioxidant properties, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, in all the colon beneficial uh, uh, properties. Okay, thank you very much for all your answers. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to ask for more questions, but uh, as I can see on the slides, uh, you, you have the email of Andrea to, to if you want to, to yeah, continue so discussing about this research. So uh, I uh, need... avoid any... Sorry, yeah, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Andrea. So we have to 